focus on headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters Han Dan and Chung Sebom. Guys, welcome back. Hello, SJ. Uh, guys, it's been just over a week uh, since the uh, the national tragedy that happened over in Itaewon all of last week. Of course, we're at a national mourning period. Uh, we've covered extensively on what actually happened. Uh, the UN administration, of course, has been focusing on thorough investigation in order to prevent any future crisis from ever happening again. Uh, from what I understand, uh, we have President Yoon se making an official remark today at a meeting. Uh, Sebon, uh, kick us off with this. Uh, tell us what was discussed there. All right. President Yoon participated in the National Safety System Review meeting today and made his first formal apology over the deadly Itaewon crowd crush, though he previously made a similar remark remarks during Buddhist and Christian memorial services. Yun also renewed his call on the government to handle the aftermath of the tragedy in a responsible manner and to improve existing anti-disaster and safety regulations to make the country safer. Observers say that the government shifted its focus from warning to safety management system innovation by President Yoon presiding the meeting as the first official schedule after the end of the national mourning period. Yoon said during the meeting that the government will work harder for Korean citizens to restore and focus on their daily lives. It's the first time that President Yoon mentioned about the recovery of daily lives in public after the national tragedy. One official from the presidential office explained that his remarks demonstrates the government's commitment to institutional improvement so that people can return to their safe daily lives. Speaking of safety system improvement, President Yoon pointed out crowd management as the core element of the follow-up measures. It's because there are mounting criticisms that we could have prevented this tragedy from happening if relevant authorities properly responded to calls and reports received about four hours before the disaster and managed the crowd. He also made it clear that Interior Minister Lee Sang-min and Police Chief Yoon Hee-gun will be held accountable upon the completion of the thorough investigation. Currently, in and outside of the presidential office, many expect that Interior Minister Lee will remain office for now, but high-ranking police officials are less likely to get away with this as their poor response system is found to be one of the main reasons for such a national tragedy. Meanwhile, according to the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, Funeral services for 130 Korean victims are completed. And for foreign victims, nine bodies out of the 26 are still waiting for repatriation, and seven among them will be sent back to their country by November 9th. All joint memorial altars across the nation were dismantled, except the one located in Nuksapyeong Station. This memorial altar will open until November 12th. Again, uh, it's now the end of the national mourning period, which means there's going to be more questioning. Uh, there's going to be more investigation and more results of the investigation that are coming out. But from the get-go, even during uh, the national mourning period, uh, what we saw was... Uh, Instead of the top officials, of course, taking responsibility from it, uh, from for the tragedy from the get-go, it was a lot of the lower end officers and the, the middle management sort of people that were getting the brunt, uh, the brunt of the blame, uh, which really irked a lot of people here. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, right now, uh, still, a lot of people are saying this could have been uh, prevented if there were protocols and measures put in place. That's not the case right now. Uh, we'll find out that more and more. I'm sure there are going to be some resignations that are going to come out here. But the most important thing is, uh, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen uh, anymore. And uh, the sad fact is, it's usually when these big major accidents and tragedies happen is when we start seeing these major changes uh, over safety as well. Uh, but uh, two miners also in other news here, at least um, some miraculous rescue news here. Two miners who are trapped for over nine days in a zinc mine in southeastern Ponga County. Uh, they were miraculously uh, rescued Friday night, uh, much to the joy of their family and the South Korean people as well. Tell, uh, tell us about this uh, very story. 
SJ, it was all the more miraculous because the rescue efforts once looked bleak with already over nine days having passed. But to the surprise of many, the two minors, one aged 62 and the other 56, both surnamed Park, miraculously walked out of the zinc mine when rescuers succeeded in locating them at last. The pair had been stuck in a vertical shaft about 190 meters underground at a zinc mine in the Punghua County in North Gyeongsang Province, some 240 kilometers southeast of Seoul, for over 220 hours since the mine collapsed on October 26th. The Punghua Fire Department said the miners have built a tent out of plastic and made a fire, uh, lit up a fire inside a tunnel to keep themselves warm. The miners said they were waiting inside and relying on each other with hope as they heard the sound of the drilling and the blast from the rescue operation. They also said they survived an instant coffee mix powder that they brought with them uh, as they entered the mine to work and by drinking water that fell down from the mine shaft. Rescue workers have been searching for the trapped miners for days uh, by drilling multiple holes and sending down endoscopes to reach the underground point where the two men were trapped, uh, but they did face a lot of difficulties due to unfavorable tunnel conditions. Rescue authorities last Thursday uh, fixed two final points at the mine, presumed to be the places under which the two miners are isolated, and the site uh, where they were discovered was a circular 100 meter square meter space without 30 meters, uh, about 30 meters away from where they had worked. Uh, I mean, it's just, again, miraculous is an understatement here. And it is interesting that they had the instant coffee powder mix because uh, with this, I mean, it has sugar, right? And the sugar mm-hmm. allows, gives you that energy boost. And, and what's also more impro- impressive is the fact that they're age 62 and 56 uh, stuck down there for nine days here. Uh, it is one of those kind of uh, news that we all, I think, as people of South Korea really needed. But uh, how are they doing right now? Because, I mean, it must have really impacted their health to be down there and also so, uh, be in a dark area for such a long time. What did they say after this? Uh, just miraculously walking out uh, uh, from underground there. Well, fortunately, they're both in good condition, making quick recovery. Doctors at Andong Hospital, where they're now hospitalized, uh, expect the two patients to be discharged in a few days. Although they have trouble sleeping, uh, one of them having continuous nightmares, uh, they're both in stable condition, mentally and physically, and one of them said that he feels like, quote-unquote, he's been reborn and is experiencing the world for the first time. According to local authorities, they thanked rescuers for their efforts to save them and were overjoyed hearing that they can meet their family members waiting outside. Uh, Their family members said it was hard to believe that they walked out of the mine on foot alive and were very much relieved to find out that they're in stable condition. The accident occurred when about 900 tons of soil poured down into a vertical shaft at the mine. And the government has launched an on-site inspection with related ministries to find the exact cause of the collapse and why such huge amounts of soil were piled up near the area. The company where the two miners worked, the mine company, is now facing mounting criticisms as it first made a 119 call 14 hours after the accident occurred. Uh, Now, a mine collapse uh, at the same vertical shaft killed one and injured another just about a month before the two miners were trapped. President Yoon Song yeol sent a thank you letter and gifts to the two survivors, saying that a new hope was given to the Korean people who were weighed down with sorrow, uh, obviously referring to the Itaewon uh, yeah. Halloween stampede. 14 hours after the accident occurred, that's just... I can't believe this. I mean, you know, to be honest with you, this this past few uh, past week or so uh, has been just, I guess, mentally 
uh, draining for a lot of the people, and there's a lot of people who are just concerned over these accidents because uh, I still have trouble sleeping. I'm still reeling from the shock. Well, I mean, of even the Ite- 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 crash. yeah, and then even just uh, yesterday, right? Uh, we had the uh, the Bugunghua train uh, that derailed. Right. Uh, you know, it injured 30 people or so, which, by the way, had led to major delays on the KTX uh, lines uh, here in the Seoul area because of this. And so uh, everyone did. They were saying that because the one line w- was all you know delayed, and everyone was there. During rush hour, there's so many people. P- people are so sensitive over crowds right now, mm-hmm. over what happened with Itaewon. And then when we heard about this uh, mine collapse, it was very concerning. But it was finally some good news that we got out. And I think now more and more people are more uh, sensitive and more concerned about safety, I think, is the most important thing. And I think uh, what we need to do is make sure that certain companies and certain organizations, they make sure that they make some kind of changes over safety before these accidents happen. Because even with the right. the, the mining accidents, it's unbelievable. When there's some ma- another massive accident happened not too long ago prior to all right. this, right? And like you said, SJ, you know, uh, there will be Lots of grilling over um, the inadequate response of the fire department and the police uh, regarding the Itaewon crowd crush. But also, I think a lots of grilling is expected uh, regarding this mine collapse as well, because like I mentioned, a mine collapse just killed one, yeah. killed one person, one miner and injured another uh, just about a month before uh, at the similar Location, in fact, at the same vertical shaft yeah, yeah. Uh, where the two miners have been recently rescued. So uh, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of uh, safety measures regarding miners and, and the mine company will also come under the spotlight. Oh, goodness. All right. Uh, let's now get some more news now on the Yoon administration. This time, uh, President Yoon appointing Education Minister as he finally completed his cabinet 181 days after he took office. Uh, there was some uh, mounting criticism over the initial appointment of the Education Minister back then. Uh, now, this, uh, Sebum, you have more information about this. Uh, tell us about the newly appointed Education Minister. Sure. President Yoon Song yeol appointed Lee Ju Ho this morning as Deputy Prime Minister. Minister for Social Affairs and Education Minister, finally completing the lineup of his cabinet some six months after taking office. Lee Ju Ho is a professor at the Korea Development Institute and former Education Minister under the Lee Myung Bak administration, and he was named Education Minister and Deputy Prime Minister for Social Affairs in September. And on October 28th, he underwent a confirmation hearing, but the National Assembly failed to adopt a report on the hearing. However, as the president proceeded with Lee's appointment without the National Assembly's consent, he became the 14th senior government official under the Yoon administration to be appointed without parliamentary approval. Lee succeeds Park soon who quit in August only a month after taking office amid public opposition to her plan to lower the elementary school starting age. Yoon's first nominee for Education Minister Kim in chol withdrew amid allegations of favoritism related to his family's reception of scholarships from a non-profit organization. It's expected that Minister Lee has a lot to solve and address as soon as he takes office. First and foremost, he has to take care of the 2023 National College Entrance Exam dubbed CSAT, which will take place within just 10 days. Also, considering the national tragedy happened in Itaewon, students' mental health and safety education have emerged as a new main task for him. Another thing is that he has to finalize the revision of the 2022 curriculum and receive the approval from the National Education Commission, but it will not be an easy task for him since there is a controversy over stating freedom in front of democracy. That's right. I almost forgot that the uh, the CSAT, the, uh, the, the college entrance exam, is not too long away here. But uh, yeah, it has not been a... <laughs> Uh, a smooth road for some of these uh, cabinet nominations, here, especially for the uh, the education minister. Uh, I almost forgot about uh, Park soon who of course had to resign because of the, the lowering of the elementary school starting age. Uh, but even from the get-go, right, uh, Kim Min-chul, uh, 
allegations of uh, you know giving out uh, these scholarships to his family members. Forgot about that. But again, uh, education one of those things that uh, you know Koreans think you know very they think very important of. They think it's very important. So uh, whoever the education minister is is going to have to have uh, big roles coming ahead for him. Uh, in, in the meantime, let's talk about vaccines here. It's been a long time since we last about, talked about vaccines. Uh, administrations for the bivalent COVID nineteen vaccines. Uh, this targeting the Omicron sub variants. This began starting today for adults age 18 and over uh, as the country tries to curb another resurgence here. We are actually seeing a spike in cases, by the way. Um, for example, uh, Monday's figures, usually very low. We had cases where it was like under 10,000. Now it's spiking over to 18,000. Town, let's get the latest details of this. Right. Inoculation of Omicron-specific boosters for people aged between 18 and 59 began today as the government expanded the boosters to the general public. Previously, high-risk groups, uh, including those with an immune deficiency or those aged 60 or older, were eligible to get them. Boosters produced by Moderna and Pfizer, specifically targeting the Omicron subvariant BA1, have so far been used. Uh, and boosters targeting the BA4 and BA5 subvariants will also be available for adults from next Monday. So if you go to a nearby clinic to get boosted now, you can choose between the pre-exist- pre-existing vaccines that were rolled out before the Omicron wave and the updated bivalent vaccines. Now, while authorities recommend to get the Omicron targeting upgraded bivalent boosters, there's no recommendation on the type of preferred bivalent vaccines. In other words, uh, there's no priority over Moderna or Pfizer. You Mm. can just get uh, whichever you'd like. So far, the nation has brought in 17 million doses of bivalent COVID-19 boosters. The updated boosters will be available for those who made a pre-reservation, while residual vaccines will be available for those who wish to reserve and get boosted on the same day. This comes as Korea strives to prevent another resurgence amid rising cases. The number of new infections today surpassed 18,600, up by over 4,000 uh, from two weeks ago. That that must be 400 no, 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 4,000, excuse 4, 000, me, 4,000 yeah. from two weeks ago. The figure is a slight decline from the previous record, but this is due to reduced testing on the weekend. And what authorities are noting is the fact that it marks the highest level for a Monday in seven weeks. The number of patients in critical condition rose to 365, the highest figure in 40 days, while 18 people died from COVID overnight. The fatality rate stands at 0.11%. Health authorities project up to 200,000 COVID cases per day if Korea sees a resurgence this winter season. Again, 200,000 is what they're seeing. Oh, my goodness. And we just saw, we just came out from the uh, the massive resurgence, the Omicron variant. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, I heard, I, I saw the news uh, earlier this morning, and they were saying that the... Um, the vaccination for the bivalent vaccines for those 60 and above and those who work in the nursing facilities, uh, those who are basically eligible for the bivalent vaccine so far, it, it's only uh, it's like 8.7 percent inoculation rate. That's very low. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they're saying that uh, is there it's just people are not caring about the vaccines anymore. Are they not trusting the vaccine? Uh, what is it? But other watchers are basically saying that while well, they're waiting for the BA4, to BA5 uh, tailored uh, vaccines as well. But mm-hmm. I think because so many people have been, uh, you know, getting COVID-19, they're saying, what's the point of getting the vaccine if we're going to get caught anyways and so forth. But, you know, health experts would say that if you get vaccinated, it lowers the chance of, uh, you know, death from uh, COVID-19. Right. But the, uh, man, the critical condition number is uh, kind of concerning. 365, we were at 200 something just about last week. So it's really rising uh, mm-hmm. quite a bit here. Uh, we have some news on North Korea, as uh, again, uh, some of the other news that we've been covering uh, in detail uh, here in our show has been the tension here on the Korean Peninsula with North Korea's continued provocation. Uh, it's been reported North Korea conducted four-day military operations last week, but to fire two strategic missiles just 80 kilometers off the southeastern coast of Ursan 
is what the North State run media is saying. This is kind of an interesting story because South Korea actually did not report on this. Seven, let's get the updates on this. Okay, as you just said, the general staff of the Korean People's Army, or KPA, conducted four day military operations starting from November 2nd to 5th and claimed that it fired two strategic missiles just 80 kilometers off the southeastern coast of Ulsan. But South Korea's military authorities said it's far from the truth. North Korea's military said today it will take sustained, resolute, and overwhelming practical military measures by slamming the recent vigilant storm exercise as an open provocation to escalate the tension in the region. If you look at the detailed account provided by the KPA, on Wednesday morning, they fired four tactical ballistic missiles from North Pyongan province to a desert island of the West Sea. And Pyongyang's air force on the east and west coastal areas also fired 23 ground-to-air missiles while staging an exercise to destroy air targets at different altitudes and distances. The north then fired two strategic cruise missiles with a shooting range of 590.5 kilometers at the open sea around 80 kilometers off the coast of Ulsan in South Korea from north Hamgyong province in response to Seoul's firing of air-to-surface guided missiles and gliding guided bombs. And on Thursday, it conducted a test fire of ballistic missile to verify the movement reliability of a special functional warhead that paralyzes the operation command system of the enemy. The North appears to be referring to its latest launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile, which Seoul presumes that it has ended in failure. On Friday, it staged a large-scale all-out combat sortie operation of the Air Force, involving around 500 fighters, and fired two tactical ballistic missiles as well as two super-large multiple launch missiles the following day, according to the report. From Monday through Saturday, Seoul and Washington staged a large-scale combined air exercise involving hundreds of military aircraft. And against this, the North fired more than 30 missiles into the East Sea and the Yellow Sea last week alone. The intelligence communities of South Korea and the U.S. say the Kim Jong-un regime has completed preparations for a seventh nuclear test. They say the North Korea may choose an exact timing in consideration of the U.S. midterm election to maximize the effects of the experiment. That's right. In the U.S. midterm elections is uh, Tuesday, their uh, local time. So it, right now, it's uh, they're moving into uh, Monday right now. It might happen any time uh, in the next 24 hours is what the intelligence uh, you know, community are saying. But I mean, this is interesting. I mean, they're saying that they fired two strategic cruise missiles right off the coast of uh, Ulsan, which is really, really concerning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but who is not telling the truth here? Is it North Korea that's making things up? Uh, and basically saying, oh, look at this. Uh, South Korean military officials were not able to detect our cruise missiles. This is the kind of technology that we have trying to cover up for the failed intercontinental ballistic missile firing. Or has it just... I, I, this is, I mean, it's it's baffling, to be honest with you. But North Korea could make up stuff like this. So who knows? Uh, South Korea, meanwhile, launching its annual computer-simulated Tegeka military drill uh, amid heightened tensions on the Korean peninsula. Tan, let's get more on this as well. Right. The four-day Tegeka training aimed at countering diversifying North Korean threats kicked off today. According to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the computer-assisted command post exercise is a defensive drill that focuses on strengthening crisis management capabilities and the ability to transition into wartime and train operational capabilities against various threats, including those from North Korea's nuclear and missile programs. Uh, This marks the first time in four years the Taeguk exercise uh, is conducting is being conducted solo as it was previously combined with the government-led emergency training, the Ulti Contingency Drill. More specifically, the Taeguk drill uh, has been conducted annually between May and June since 1995, although the name of the exercise mm. have changed. 
uh, but it was postponed to October in consideration of inter-Korean and North Korea-U.S. dialogue in 2018, and it was integrated with the government's Ulti exercise the following year. In 2020, it was canceled due to COVID-19 and flood damage. Although it's a computer simulated exercise that doesn't involve actual troops or military equipment or field training, uh, this will make November the fourth consecutive month that South Korea has held military drills, starting with the South Korea U.S. Joint Uchi Freedom Shield exercises held in August. Earlier today, uh, North Korean military issued a statement that uh, threatened to take, quote unquote, sustained, resolute and overwhelming military measures, calling the Taeguk drills anti-North Korea war drills of the enemy. The Taeguk drill comes after the North fired more than 30 missiles into the East and the West Seas last week in protest against Vigilant Storm, the largest uh, Korea-U.S. joint air drill in five years. That's right. And uh, we know that uh, for sure, in response to the Taeguk drill, North Korea is probably going to be conducting more provocation. Or mm -hmm. uh, since they did say that North Korea, uh, U.S. and uh, South Korean uh, intelligence official did say that uh, North Korea is now completed with their pro preparations for their uh, seventh nuclear test. Will their next provocation be a nuclear weapons test uh, is the big question. So again, for all of our listeners out there, uh, there is going to be a lot of focus on what North Korea's next moves are going to be. And this could potentially be uh, the big topic to be discussed here on Korea now for the rest of the week here. Uh, guys, uh, moving on here amid the rising tensions in the region, uh, Japan conducting an international fleet review on Sunday. Uh, we talked about this uh, some time ago, uh, back before when we were talking about it, it was whether South Korea was going to take part in this very fleet review uh, because of the controversy of the, the the flag that they used, the Japanese Navy, they use a flag that's the Rising Sun flag, and I've mentioned on the show a number of times why it's so controversial. Uh, but South Korea's Navy uh, naval vessels did take part in this uh, event for the very first time in seven years. Uh, this is considering North Korea's continued provocations. Uh, Samuel, let's get the details of this. Sure. Since 2018, when tensions between Seoul and Tokyo rose over historical and other disputes, the two sides have not participated in each other's fleet reviews. However, as Pyongyang continues its missile and nuclear provocations, South Korea joined Japan's international fleet review for the first time in seven years. The review took place in Sagami Bay of Kanagawa Prefecture, about 40 kilometers southeast of Tokyo, with the participation of 12 countries, including the US, Canada, and Australia. Soyang, a 10,000-ton logistics support ship of South Korea's Navy, was among the 18 vessels that took part in this event to promote peace and commemorate the 70th founding anniversary of the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. As the host, Japan showcased 20 vessels to celebrate the special day with the rising sun flags. However, the flag is recognized as a symbol of the former colonial ruler's wartime aggression to many Koreans, the scene that South Korean sailors saluted towards Japan's helicopter carrier Izmo, carrying Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, is expected to stir controversy here in Korea. It's analyzed that President Yoon took the risk and decided to join Japan's fleet review as a security cooperation between the two countries have increasingly become important against the evolving nuclear and missile threats from Pyongyang. Meanwhile, following the review, the Navy ship Soyang plans to join a multinational search and rescue exercise. The exercise will bring together service members from the United States, Britain, France, Australia, Canada, and many other countries. That's right. Again, I mean, there was it was marked by a lot of controversy here, but uh, you know, people can argue that because of the ongoing provocations and just the tension on the Korean Peninsula, and of course, uh, one of the few things that right now Seoul and Tokyo could really collaborate on and uh, work together on is, of course, related to North Korea-related issues here, and U.S. also pushing for more collaboration between Seoul and Tokyo. Uh, but nevertheless, here, uh, present the the presidential office are reportedly mulling ways to rearrange and minimize the itinerary of uh, President Yoon suk yeol's upcoming trip to Southeast Asia uh, as pressure grows on the top office for the government's inadequate measures in response to the Itaewon Halloween 
Crush, uh, Tan, what do we know so far now? Well, President Yoon is set to make a trip to Southeast Asia this month to attend a series of multilateral meetings. And due to the growing domestic pressure, the top office is reportedly rearranging his schedule to cross out non-compulsory gatherings. The series of global meetings will serve as another momentum to strengthen regional security and economic cooperation, uh, but um, amid rising criticisms on the government's inadequate measures and response to the Itaewon Halloween stampede, it looks like the presidential office is feeling heavy responsibility and feeling obligated to minimize the president's stay in Southeast Asian nations. Uh, According to various diplomatic sources, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or the ASEAN Summit, will be held in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, from the 10th to the 13th, and the G20 Summit will be held in Bali, Indonesia, from the 15th. And this will be followed by the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or the APEC Summit, which will be held in Bangkok, Thailand, on the 18th and the 19th. Security cooperation against North Korea's growing provocations as well as economic cooperation are expected to take center stage and a trilateral summit between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, as well as bilateral summit uh, with the U.S. and Japan are also likely to take place. A key presidential official uh, said uh, suggestions to reduce the tour schedule of President Yoon are being delivered to the top office from all directions and uh, especially to minimize the schedule at the G20 summit set to be held in Bali, a resort area. Uh, Meanwhile, Japanese news outlets reported that Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will hold a summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping and President Yoon Song yeol The Korean government, however, drew the line, saying it has not started discussing the matter with Japan. It's so interesting how these reports always come out uh, that that uh, the leaders of South Korea and Japan are going to be holding summits. And then once it's released by one country's media, they say the other side just goes, oh, well, no, (laughs) it's not finalized. I mean, because even with uh, the recent meeting between uh, Fumio Kishida and uh, Yoon Sang-gyar, we called it a summit. Uh, Of course, Tokyo did not call it a summit. Mm -hmm. It was like a sideline meeting, right? It was just uh, not an official summit there. Uh, But yeah, it is. um, it's, It's a difficult situation right now for President Yoon to leave the country Uh, As I've said, now that not to say that it takes only a week for people to cope and recover from what we experienced, what we saw for the from the the Itaewon tragedy. uh, But it is now time that there's going to be a lot of questioning uh, of the the current administration, the current government, uh, some of the ministers involved, uh, some of the police, uh, the police chief and so forth. And so uh, the president not being there. Uh, is going to be, it, it's going to strike some criticism and it's mm-hmm. going to be very tough. But not, I mean, these are all major, major. Uh, you know, international events that uh, President Yoon suk does need to uh, take part in. But uh, we'll see what happens here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it's been some years as uh, since the climate crisis has been emerging as a global agenda. Uh, we're not even calling it a climate change anymore. It's a climate crisis, to be honest with you. Uh, the UN Climate Summit uh, kicking off in Egypt on Sunday. This is the COP27. Sebom, uh, tell us what they're going to be discussing this year. Of course, this year's UN Climate Summit, called COP27, began on Sunday in the seaside resort town of Sharoum El Sheikh in Egypt. Delegates from nearly 200 countries gathered around to tackle the climate crisis, even under difficult circumstances caused by the Russia-Ukraine war, as well as rampant inflation. The main agenda of this year's summit is climate compensation. It's to discuss rich nations paying out funds to help poor countries cope with the consequences of global warming for which they bear little blame. COP27 President Shamel Sukri told the opening plenary that the inclusion of this agenda reflects a sense of solidarity for the victims of climate disasters, and the decision created an institutionally stable space for discussion of funding for loss and damage. In fact, during COP 16 that took place in 2010, wealthy nations promised to provide $100 billion every year to developing countries until the year 2020 to help their climate adaptation. However, only 80% of the fund was provided. 
Although developing countries now argue that the funds initially promised are far from enough, that as they are seeing more losses and damages due to frequent climate disasters, it is unclear whether countries around the world agree to ramp up their donations, considering food and energy crisis caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as massive inflationary pressures. They will also review countries' NDC targets to limit the increase in global temperature to within 1.5 degrees Celsius as promised in the Paris Climate Agreement back in 2015, while looking at whether um, the Glasgow Climate Pact adopted during last year's COP26 has been properly implemented. However, given that only 24 out of the 193 countries submitted enhanced NDC targets, and the amount of global coal power generation has increased by 1% over the past year, fulfilling the promise to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will not be easy at all. No, it's definitely not. Uh, and again, you know, we often talk about the, the, the Paris Agreement, right? The, the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, all the, the climate experts right now, they're saying that the way that the world is being operated, there is absolutely no way they're going to be able to keep this. And I know that there's been a lot of talks and there's been a lot of meetings there's been a lot of money that's being funded to kind of uh, lower the carbon emission you know we talk about the 2030 uh car- you know what is it uh, carbon neutrality 2050 carbon neutrality all these different plans but the fact right now is that we're realizing that more and more countries are actually more dependent on coal energy mm. than before right now and it is really tough to kind of you know take a step back and go into a greener uh, economy and in a greener world because it does also take a lot cost a lot of money to do that which is why a lot of the uh, the developing countries are have been asking for money in order for them to kind of transition into this greener economy and so forth but unfortunately uh, it is it seems like it's a very difficult task at this time but something needs to be done because climate crisis is uh, getting out of hand to be honest with you guys thank you very much for coming in today with your report today as always please stay safe and uh, we'll see you guys again thank Thank you you very much you can listen to korea now with me sj lee by downloading the arirang radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com so make sure you tune in mondays through fridays 6 p.m to 8 p.m korea time